It was basically a cube with inside of sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the other show on KGRA. Uh, usually with Andy McGrillan and Dan Zetterstrom, but it's just me, Dan Zetterstrom, this week again. Um, hopefully I won't just leave the studio at the end this week, uh, though if I pretend that that was intentional, then the comedic timing makes me a genius, I think. Um, it wasn't, but uh, I'll, I'll pretend it was. Uh, just before we go on, um, I just want to say that Andy's doing well, um, much better than he was. He, he's just, uh, you know, just a little low energy. Um, so he, he's on the mend. Um, and yeah, so he, he should be back with us in the next week. Um, he is doing a very cool interview uh, this evening with somebody that I'll, I'll tell you guys about at the end. Um, but you should all hear that soon as well. Um, just before we go on, um, just to mention our sponsors, uh, Manscaped, uh, you can get 20% off with the coupon Andy UFO, uh, buy gifts for family, friends, uh, make your enemies beautiful. Even they should have perfect orbs to support the show in other ways. You can sign up for Patreon uh, at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast. You can also find us on Spotify Premium, Apple Podcasts with a two-week free trial, as well as sign up via the YouTube channel. You get some cool things like early access to interviews. Regular members only ask me any things. So with that, let me introduce our first guest. I should say, actually, before we go on, that uh, Dave Partry <coughs> may not be able to join us. Uh, just he's having some some issues with power at the moment at home, but that's cool because our, our guest is great and and wonderful and and yeah, it'll here he is. There you go, Vinny Disclosure Team. Hey, Dan, I, how's I, it going, man? I'm great. I, I had this big intro planned for you, so I'm just gonna read this because I, I kind of want like a drum roll moment. Um, this next gentleman blasted into the community from Instagram and just has not stopped. His kindness, positivity, and balanced approach to the subject is infectious. Researcher, podcaster, and surely he was a dog in a past life. Our colleague from UAP Media UK and our own and his own channel, Disclosure Team, Vinny Adams. Wow. How was that Thank for an you intro? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah that, that's up there, man. I, 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 I blush and always feel humbled by those kind of things, man. <laughs> I'm like, where is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, you're very welcome. So just before we we crack on with the main portion of the show, I thought we kind of do a, a recap of the week. Not a crazy amount has happened, but there have been a few choice moments, right? Um, the, the main one, <clears throat> the NDAA passed the house. Ooh. It's a little convoluted the way it's happened. Usually it goes through the House, through the Senate, and then to the President. But this time it's gone through the House, to the Senate, and then back again. Sounds like a little yes. Rings movie. Um, but yeah, they they it is now Bill S-1605. Um, it passed the House 363 votes to 70. And no one complained about the UAP stuff. It speaks volumes, right? That speaks a lot of volumes. Definitely, man. Yeah. What's... um. No doubt you've read the bill. So what what are just some of the highlights for you from it? Well, I think what really stood out to me that it is almost got the same language in it as the original Gillibrand amendment. You know, there's a few little bits that seem to be missing, but it's, you know, it's still a lot more than, say, AOI MSG. It's not just a like a straightforward yeah we'll have a look at it kind of thing there's still some really important points in there um and i think it, it to me it just seems like the wording's been changed a little bit um so yeah i'm really positive and it's really funny because obviously i know that you've been keeping your eye on it like glued to it so i've been kind of feeding off you constantly <laughs> um so yeah the excitement has been up and down with it jumping back and forth you know and not going that usual route of kind of house senate president it's kind of that back and forth so i'm like 
up and then down and then up and then down but yeah i'm really positive i you know from what i can hear from speaking to people there shouldn't be any more like roadblocks or anything like that it's just it's just a waiting game for it to all get signed through into law now yeah pretty much um i think the 14th is when they can next kind of progress tuesday Um, yeah and and we're looking at um basically no more amendments can kind of be tacked on now so so we're almost at like this the very very final version of what this is going to be i can i can stop checking the congress website then and and i'm sure doug dean johnson will be glad to look away from it too yeah because i hear it's not the best i mean i've been on it but i know from you that it's not the best website either to kind of keep tabs on it's not there's a lot going on to be fair and you, you know once you wade into the shallow end of the political system in america you soon realize oh god there's all these moving parts and i don't really understand yeah. what i'm looking at so it kind of reflects that in a way um but there's a you you can save searches if you you know set up an account you can save searches there um so i've just got basically a standing search for the few bills that kind of we've been following along any changes will notify me same with anything that comes up with uap or unidentified um wow. in it and you get some things mixed in but i want to keep my my filter nice and loose so i don't miss anything you know yeah of course that's good it was i think it was the the working with allies bit for me from the bill that stood out i mean it, there's all the kind of biological effects stuff and the fact they're setting up essentially a crash retrieval unit, which, yeah. you know, the first the first public one, we'll say. Um, but working with allies, you know, being from the UK, you exactly can share my frustration. Like, yes. just, you, you get that party line all the time. Um, and I can't wait for them to engage. They they had a, a meeting today, uh, Kathleen Hicks, uh, with her counterpart here. And... It doesn't say in the, in the report whether they spoke about UAP, but they spoke about defense strategies and they spoke about a partnership for space. So uh, I imagine, you, you know, it, it's certainly in that ballpark of conversation, right? So I hope so. Hopefully they're talking about it. Whether I mean, or not that was a press they are. That was a press release that, where it came out on the DoD website, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So it's pretty yeah. official stuff. So, you know, if they're, if they're having this really important meeting then they're probably going to want to cover a lot of topics with relations to to that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'd like to think that there was UAP talk in there, you know. In my head, there was. <laughs> but, <laughs> it, it would definitely make know. sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I just wanted to read out some Twitter statements um, because Senator Gillibrand has been quite vocal this week. Yeah. Um, initially, so Brian Bender posted a few uh tweets with statements from various uh, co-sponsors of the bill. Um, and so her, her first statement was basically the office will have the authority to establish a coordinated effort to report and respond to UAPs, significantly improve data sharing between agencies on UAP sightings, address national security concerns, and report health effects people may experience in relation to UAP events. It goes on, it's a longer statement. Um, you can pop on her website. I'd recommend that uh, because the the full statement is there. It's really extensive. It's very yeah. clear that this isn't just on a whim for her. Um, you, you know, there, there's something called the one percent rule that's been spoken about. I.e., if there's even a one percent chance that this, you, you know, violates the the security of the airspace, then it's something that they have to take seriously. And, and I'm glad they are. Yeah. With that. We we've just had a, a, a guest pop in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read his little introduction. So joining us again this week because he was with us last week, uh, fellow member of UAP Media and creator of Shadows of Your Mind magazine, this selfless soul donated an amazing prize to the raffle that we'll talk about at the end, folks. Dave Partridge, how are you, Dave? I'm all right. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We yeah. we've missed you. Cool. Yeah, well, good nice. to see you, mate. Yeah, me too, mate. Uh, nightmare. You need to power cut this time of night. Hey, <laughs> you made it. You're here now. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the main thing. And and you're all good and healthy. And you, you know now Andy's basically better. We can we can tease him and and say that you were better. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we've just been talking about uh, uh, kind of a recap of the week um, and. Mm. You, you've come in just as we were wrapping up, but what 
what was a highlight for you from the from the bill s1605 the ndaa i think the fact that they've actually mentioned transmedium um objects in the wording of the bill i think that's a major step forward and i don't think we you know this time last year we could never have hoped for something like that um so you know we have to hope that um yeah, and get signed off in the next couple of days or at least by the end of the year. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I, I would I would put five pounds on us seeing it signed before Christmas, but mm. we'll see. Hopefully. Hopefully. So just before we, we were jumping on here, uh uh kind of I wanted to say miraculous, but not really miraculous, expected. Uh for a while, the community has been waiting for the results of a study by uh, Jacques Vallée and Gary Nolan on the materials. I was going to say Matt's materials. I'll say materials. I'll keep it broad just in case. On the materials that Jacques have, has collected over the years whilst researching UFO cases. If you've watched James Fox's The Phenomenon, you'll, you'll have seen a segment in there uh, featuring both Jack and Gary um, discussing a little bit about what they were doing. Uh, being a bit cagey about the results mm. because they wanted a peer-reviewed paper to come out first. Well, today is that day. The peer-reviewed paper is out. Wow. There is a feature on Gary Nolan in Vice where he goes into detail about what some of the results may imply. Um, and there's also a really great video interview. Get Gary is a very affable guy, so it's great to he hear him open up about what he's been doing because it's it's all kind of amazing outside of the UFO stuff just because he he explains in the article that his involvement came about because people studying certain aspects of the phenomena sought him out because he was basically the best at what he did. And he was building all of these the devices to measure things in a certain way that other people just couldn't. Um, so yeah, what, what did you think of that, Vinny? Um, I knew it was coming. I've been kind of anticipating it for some time. I didn't really, uh, I haven't probably thought about it for a couple of weeks and then obviously saw that Vice article today linked straight to Jesse Michael's video, the interview video with Gary Nolan. So I straight away was on it and um, yeah, I was blown away. I thought it was incredible. You know, when he was talking about these materials and in a way I felt like he was still a little bit vague because he talked about some of the materials as kind of almost regular metals slightly mixed, like it's kind of prosaic and normal. But then he was talking about ones which have got high levels of bismuth and talking about terahertz and how it's really abnormal and stuff, which, you know, I'm not scientific, but it still kind of made it clear that it was something really mind-blowing and eye-opening to people like Gary Nolan, who, you know, if it's mind-blowing to them, then it's something special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the whole thing is the, um, the isotopic ratio anomalies, isn't it? Exactly. Um, which we saw... Uh, first saw well i first saw in patient 17 um the film by jeremy corbell about uh dr roger lear removing yeah. an implant from a guy and can't, i don't think it was gary nolan who examined the material that came out but there's definitely some variations that you know indicated that this wasn't a terrestrial manufactured uh, piece of metal yeah 100 percent um when when i was reading through the paper oh sorry not the paper the article i have the paper i didn't have a chance to read it before we went live unfortunately um but and i know you dave especially are going to groan when i say this but uh in some instances ball lightning is said to kind of produce and drop these materials and mm -hmm. i'm not implying that any of these craft are ball lightning but y you know the I suspect or I have an idea that maybe that process is used by the engines in the craft um, and, and that this is a byproduct of that process. We'll, we'll see, though. Um, but, yeah, it, it's intriguing. Very intriguing. Um, the, the part that interested me most was where he was talking about the areas of the brain um, in experiences. Um, and he, sorry, the, the brain in experiences has an abnormal amount of white matter um and the thing i hadn't heard before was that they actually had results for some some experiences from before they had the experience 
and they were able to compare and they they realized that this anomaly had been in in their brains since birth which is very very interesting there, wow. I, I yeah. know there, there are some ideas about filters in the brain and how it affects us and and these bits of white matter were around um an area of the brain that's responsible for intuition um which when it comes to the woo in this, <laughs> in this subject is a bit suspect right hmm. very i like that though i like that this woo is becoming more normalized you know in the conversation you can talk straight nuts and bolts and day to day to data bringing a little bit of woo just seems a little bit natural more these days i quite like it i'm, I'm coming around to the idea you know so the woo train has left the station very slowly <laughs> but i think the woo train and the nuts and bolts train have collided a bit as well you know <laughs> that's the thing <laughs> Look, that's that's the way it seems to be going. You, you know, Galileo mm -hmm. kind of separated, you, you know, the the stuff that we would find it hard to quantify uh, from the other stuff, and I feel like we're getting to the other stuff now. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know where science is going to go in the next, you know, fifty years, but it's super exciting. Yeah. Um, just a little bit in conclusion on that article, just Gary Nolan said that there were two of 12 objects that he studied that have altered isotopic ratios, implying that they were engineered. That's as close as we have to a number of how much real UFO debris do we know about? Sure. Do you guys think that uh, they're, they're holding full intact craft or would you be more inclined to think that they were holding bits and pieces? I'm going to go with bits and pieces. I'm going to go yeah. with, I think, from what we can gather with Gary Nolan, he's talked about, you know, we saw the small pieces in the video that we saw today. They talk about bigger pieces. But in my mind, that goes to kind of, you know, it doesn't go to a 40-foot disc or anything like that, in my mind. But, of course, we don't know. But in my mind, I don't want to jump that far ahead. So I'm thinking when they talk about bigger pieces, I'm just thinking... You know, but that uh, again, it's it's kind of how much do yeah, I like want to paperweight size? Yeah, well, you know, like yeah. how do you define how do you find define a bigger piece? Mm. That's a good question. That's that's a good point, actually, because I guess if you've got a material that can bend time and space, what is small to us could be very big to somebody it's, else. You know, it's so hard to quantify, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Is, so is I don't want to go out there and go big. You know, I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't want to go. Yeah, they they got a, you know three quarters of a forty foot disc. That's the bigger piece. I don't want to get go that far. Even though I'd love it to be like that, so I'm going to go. Yeah, they've got a bigger piece than something like that. You know, it's like know. different pieces have been split off and you know given to different governments around the world. You just need these governments to talk to each other and fit them all back together. <sighs> That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, damn, if you just said that a little bit down the road, that would have been a great segue between the, the movies that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, so let's let's get to it. Let's jump in. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about uh, Hollywood and UFOs. Uh, John Ramirez has said in some interviews, he's alluded to um, Hollywood getting some real information from certain places. Um, there's also an interesting aspect to it that we kind of use movies and pop culture as shorthand these days. So just as a quick example, current Marvel stuff, people can talk about multiverses now. hundred years ago, it would have broken people's brains to think about that. And now, <laughs> I mean, yeah. And, and some, you, you know, they, there are still some confusing aspects of those shows to some people. Um, mm. So they're lofty, they're lofty <laughs> concepts that they're dealing in. Um, but that's just sci-fi for you, you know, making the lofty palatable. Um, Sorry, I lost my place. Yeah, let's <laughs> cool. Let's talk about UFO films. So, first up, I'm just going to share the fact that uh, Lou's favorite movie, uh, Lou Elizondo's favorite movie, is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And that is going to be my first pick. Um, mostly because, one, it folds in, you know, some real events. So, when people are watching it, they actually get to experience, you know, almost the panic and anxiety that these kind of things would induce in a radar room um, or on a passenger plane. Um, and I really like that. The other thing is the fact that artists and scientists are drawn to uh, Devil's Tower at the end to kind of interact with these beings. And 
it's only recently that I've started thinking this way, but I think of artists as kind of intuitives now. And Diana Pasolka makes the point of artists and mathematicians all kind of having similar insights into the universe. And, and I thought that was an interesting crossover because when, when you're trying to communicate with a species and you don't have language, the only thing you really have is going on intuition. You know, are you going to try following your gut and kind of making shapes in the sand or are you going to try a dance or, you know, that kind of stuff. And in this case, they, they kind of end up in this dance of light and sound that starts disparate, but really comes together and kind of, to me, sounds like two, two dance partners figuring out the steps together and then making that dance. Um, and, and I think that communication really with these craft would be something like that. Maybe not light and sound, but there's going to have to be a kind of intuitive reading of what the other one wants. Kind of similar to when you look at your dog and you're like, oh, you want to go out the back, you know? And you've not communicated, but you kind of know. Yeah. yeah, the puddle on the floor gives you a hint. <laughs> uh, what, what did you guys think of that movie? I mean, it's um, incredible. Go on, Dave, you go. I was going to say, you realise that everything goes back to H.P. Lovecraft eventually. When you're talking about communicating through dreams and all that, you know, straight out of Call of Cthulhu. So, um, you know, maybe he's just around the corner as well. Possibly. Which would be so, interesting. But yeah, I mean, it's Close Encounters is probably the seminal um, UFO and, you know, kind of fringe movie. I mean, the fact that it was done by Spielberg as well, and he had J. Allen Heiner on set as a consultant. You got the um, the French guy who's based on Jack Vallée as well. And it's just interesting seeing the descent of Richard Dreyfus through that movie. He gets, you know, he goes from the radiation burns on the side of his face where the craft goes past his car or past his truck. And then he starts kind of, he thinks he's losing his mind and that affects his mental state and the people around him, which is often the case with kind of experiences as well. Yeah, absolutely. That really stood out for me, the way his character changes throughout the film. And obviously yeah. I've watched it many years ago, probably a few times, but I rewatched it, in, I think only in the last six months. And what stood out for me were the little, little pieces where he's just at home mm. and you see them small changes of him getting a bit weirder and crazier not the main bits of the film that i've always paid attention to i've started picking out them smaller more subtle pieces of it and that's just formed this even bigger love for the movie because now i'm looking at every little detail and data point because of what i've been doing so much in the last 12 months and so so yeah it's really just shined shone a whole new light on the film for me to just it, it's it stays at the top definitely I, I think if that kind of thing was to happen for real, I think we would all go to Catalina, right? As opposed to, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they, that would be the split, right, <laughs> in the community. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Dave, go next, please. Um, well, yeah, I mean, on a talking of films which begin with some kind of major event, um, I like to throw in the abyss with James Cameron is that starts off with a USO encounter, um, something flying past this nuclear submarine at 120 knots, you know, and no one can understand what the hell it is. Um, and then, you know, the rescue mission that follows to try and get the nuclear material off that submarine, and you end up, um, well, the crew end up encountering um, what I suppose we would term now as crypto terrestrials, you know, beings which have been living in the deep pressure arena of the um you know of this massive abyss i think that's really quite cool because they're kind of communicating through bioluminescence as well which you know yeah. as any nature documentary lover knows is kind of um how most of the animal most of the creatures in the sea communicate especially at that depth anyway yeah, yeah sure. so i think what what really stood out for me in that film as well is that you see the um, the way all the people on board the sub react, that they they go through every possibility that's prosaic for so long through the movie. Mm. And then another thing that really stands out is that you only really see these other beings as lights before you see what's within the light, the actual entities themselves. 
And so it plays more off of not so much the visuals, but what it just how the story's told. And I think that's what's really good about the film. It doesn't rely on massive special effects in this. It it it, it keeps you thinking and makes you mm. your brain work. Mm. I think that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and those special effects were groundbreaking at the time when you get the um, the manipulation of the seawater as well, and kind of changes into the different faces of the crew. And yeah, you know, yeah, you're having a laugh, and then obviously the military side of the crew comes in and just ruins everything. Uh, someone in the comments is saying spoilers. April, <laughs> we we love you, but go go watch the abyss. It's it's been a while. I, I forget when it came out, but you know, go, go watch it, check it out. Yeah, you've watch the director's time. cut. And there's also an incredible documentary that kind of shows you behind the scenes. Um, that you should save that for after, though, because that that spoilers, because that'll tell you the whole film B for B. We haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really love the abyss. It was kind of like if Stephen King did UFOs to me. Um, he he's very much is is one of these writers who will, will establish his characters. It'll kind of feel like a, a a you know a very normal story. Um, and then just from left field in the last third, it'll kind of the supernatural will slam into the story. Um, and that's kind of what happens with the abyss. You know, it sneaks up. Mm -hmm. It's just this cool film about an underwater facility with a few weird things in at the beginning, and and then until it goes full tilt crazy at the end it's these things are only slightly peppered throughout um and i really like that because you, you know if you looked across our species in terms of the frequency how, how many people are on this planet versus how often we see them you know in, in a little microcosm it, it, you you probably get one every like 40 50 years you know so it would be kind of disparate it would feel very normal until it wasn't um you, you know pretty pretty much after that point where they come you, you know, at the board at the end, it pretty much turns into signs, I figure, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vinny, give us a movie. I'm going back to a classic. I'm going to start with The Thing. Ooh. So this was probably one of... I mean, I'm, I must have seen this when I was probably like 10, 12 years old. And, you know, when you're that young and you're watching something that's an 18, you're kind of kind of excited about seeing something that's probably going to scare you a bit. And so it stuck with me and I watched it obviously many times since. Now, I like the way that it opens and you've got this Norwegian crew just being wild and trying to catch this dog. And it's all a bit like, hang, hang on a minute. And then obviously you learn that, you know, you've got this, the, shape-shifting creature that can change into anything like humans dogs animals and all that and then it's confined to this antarctic base you know fascinating incredible you know edge of your seat stuff so stuck out it will it will forever stick stick out as one of my favorite yeah uh, i'm going with the original the thing the original 1984 86 something like that, that I'm one. Say. yeah yeah yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you seen the, the prequel um with kate nope. beckinsale that kind of nope. ends with, well, it leads on into, you know, the Kurt Russell version. It wasn't, yes. it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, but at the same no. time, it's nowhere near as good as the original. They're, just the way they play with tension in that film mm -hmm. is, is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, away from the UAP stuff, just technically such a well-made film. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, the... I was going to say the monster, but I'm, I'm conscious of, of, you know, using phrases like that now in case they're watching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the thing um, is, is an interesting alien because, because of the mimicry and exactly. that comes up a lot that, you know, how, how would you deal with something that could mimic anything? You, you wouldn't be able to trust what it told you. Um, and it was like trusting. Yeah. <laughs> oh God! Imagine it was just Rich Doty, just misinformation. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it sounds to you know there are people out there that who who believe Richard Doty still, and there are those of us who who know exactly you, you know what what his bag of tricks is and won't listen to what the guy says. Um, that's not even considering you, you know imagine a Richard Doty who was just amazing at expressing his message and no one knew that he was you know lying he blended in perfectly with the truth tellers 
Um, but there, there's all sorts of nature out there that that will mimic. Um, and I only learned this this week, but apparently the the cuckoo bird will kind of lay its eggs in nests that don't belong to it. Um, and as a result, you can trace the lineage of birds who once had a run in with the cuckoo bird way back when, because they still will check their nests for imposter eggs. Um, and there are certain, I, I think it was in North America, there's a certain species of bird who they're really terrible at being able to tell their eggs apart. Um, and so they know that the cuckoo has never been in this bird's territory in North America. Um, but what, what happens is that the cuckoo's egg will evolve over hundreds and hundreds of years to fit in better with the eggs of the nest that it's being put in so it can better elude uh, the the mother of, of the, sorry, the, the genuine mother. And it's kind of like this evolutionary arms race you know across history and no no one animal there is conscious of that overall thing they just know they check the egg um but here we are you know we're, we're kind of it's a it's a little crazy to think of us in an evolutionary arms race with something that can hide itself so well from us yeah <laughs> yeah no, actually i mean here? this deep animal kingdom is um you know, rife with those kind of uh, defense mechanisms, almost as well. Um, you know, you've got the leaf bugs, you've got the stick bugs, you've got you know the moths with the faces on the back that blend into the tree bark and everything like that. You know, it's, it is evolution, and who knows what we'll be capable of in the next four, five hundred to a thousand years. Well, that's the thing; they've got the camouflage and, and the cloaking as well mm. in the in the animal kingdom. Yeah. way ahead of us yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I was reading a paper just the other day of researchers who they're able to induce different emotions in a person with no side effects by just firing light at them just different light that's it and and they can make the person see things they can make them experience certain emotions and as soon as i read it i just thought oh wow like if you can do that to a person their, their reality is no longer their own reality, right? Yeah, but we hear that in the UFO world as well. When people yeah. see craft, can it be stuff that they're made to see? You know, you think about Skinwalker Ranch and the emotions that people have felt when they've walked onto that property. We've yeah. heard it many times. These are all things that relate to exactly what you just said. We've we've heard it many times. Yeah, it, it makes you wonder if we're, you know, if the reason that this seems to be coming more, more frequent uh, to us aside from the fact that, you know, we're able to just talk about it now, is that we're at this point where this technology is almost accessible to us. So, you know, the the, the caretakers are here to watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my next movie, I'm going to pick Flight of the Navigator. Ho, ho, ho. That's a, it's it's a classic. I watched it a lot as a kid. Um, it has a really incredible follow up documentary. If you don't know, um, I've the, seen it recently. The actor from the movie, the the child actor, um, he he didn't have such a great life after the film. Um, and it goes into the why of that um, and his life afterwards. He's such a lovely, just genuine soul, and it, it's a really uplifting documentary. And I'd recommend you watch it after you watch the film. Uh, very touching. But th yeah, the reason I bring Flight of the Navigator up is because I watched it again, kind of, you know, post 2017, when we had the the term, the five observables. And every single one of them is in that film. You know, I, I then the other fact is that there's this AI kind of crystalline craft that is an intelligence um, that we often hear bandied about a lot. Uh, and I think... Did someone know so? Like that's really on the nose, you know? Yeah, definitely the shape, the yeah. the material, you know, the shimmer that you see on the craft. So many little details. So many little details. Yeah, is, it, is, is it a Disney thing? Can't remember. Uh, I can't, I can't remember. remember. For sure, I I would say like ninety percent sure. Uh, yeah. If, if, if you remember, would... there's always the rumors that. Walt Disney was approached to make a UFO documentary back in the 50s. And then 
Robert Emmeniger was approached to do on behalf of Disney in the 70s and again in the 80s. So there's always been that kind of link between Disney and Disclosure almost. Well, there was that one Disney documentary on UFOs that got banned for quite some time, wasn't there? Yeah, that's yeah, right. there was. It was for one of the rides, wasn't it? But it was... Uh, Alien Encounter. I, yeah, I remember it because I went on it and my mother was terrified. She was crying. And it was, it was basically you were in this room. There was a tube in the middle of the room. These scientists said that they were bringing this alien life form in and we were going to be the first people to see it. Um, and obviously, hijinks ensue. It breaks out of the cage uh, or <laughs> out of the tube. Uh, smoke everywhere. They they had some cool effects where they had some kind of, you know, it blow wind on the back of your neck and they'd yeah. have like tassels that touch the back of your neck or the back of your feet. And, you know, some, some great kind of sounds. Incredible animatronics. I loved it which said a lot about my future, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, my parents did not like that at all. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was fairly heavy. I, I, yeah. I, I, Social experiment almost. Possibly, yeah. possibly. I've probably been tracked since then. Like he enjoyed <laughs> it. <laughs> Follow that kid. <laughs> uh, interesting. But yeah, I think it's as well with Flight of the Navigator. <clears throat> so many things they're just flying through my head now there's you know the scenes where they're just zipping along you know over the ground mm. really low and oh it's it's a i just want to be in that craft you know yeah we all do <laughs> yeah but it's been remade isn't it with um bryce dallas howard directing it i've heard i've heard i mean yeah so it'd be interesting knowing what we know now and what has come out in the public you know in the last couple of years, how are they going to approach it? You know, are they going to have like the videos, the gimbal the, and the Tic Tac, are they going to be referenced in some way? Well, maybe yeah. it'll be a Tic Tac. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the designers are going to be doing research for UFO shapes and that is a yeah, super prominent one now these days, right? Um, it's so who knows? Who knows? Yeah, Tic Tac USA can get in on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I'm going to go. Let's go, Vinny, this time. Right. I'm going like to go with. Card. I'm going to go with. I'm going to go in chronological order. So I'm going to go with Prometheus. Now, Ooh, I'm, I'm going with Prometheus specifically because of the story of the engineers and the fact that there's this old school race who almost send life out into the universe you know and i think in the movie and it even links back to that they could have created the human race from from themselves and you know that opening scene in prometheus if anyone can remember where he stood at the top of the fountain and that it's just beautiful it's it impacted me you know so yeah i like that you know i like that that kind of creation story kind of thing yeah, because that also ties into like the Anunnaki myths from Sumeria, where you know they used um, part of their DNA and fused it with you know creatures that were already here, and, you know, melded it all together. And exactly. Basically, created slaves and uh, sat around doing nothing all day. Well, we did yeah. all the work. See, I like that a lot better than we just evolved from monkeys. Like, yeah, naturally. <laughs> well, yeah, except for that million-year gap in between. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <Brush> over that. <laughs> that so. if if you ever get a chance to visit that waterfall, definitely do. It's gorgeous. Where is um, it? Iceland. Iceland. Yeah, yeah. It, it's one of the. If you go and you just kind of walked into any tourist place and said, "Take me to the top five places," they would take you there as well as you know a bunch of others. But yeah, it's go gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, huge and super loud. You can barely hear your friends talking uh, when you're next to it. It's just. Yeah, crazy. Did you go after you'd seen Prometheus? Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's not cool. not because of that, but no, yeah, but it was when when I was I, there, I was like, this is where you know they see life. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm a I'm a nerd anyway. So like there, there's just a lot in Iceland. There's a point where as, as well you can walk between two um tectonic plates. Um and it's where they actually did the experiments and realized that there's this actual tectonic plate movement they basically just took two sticks in the ground and just went how far apart are they this year for a whole bunch of years and went they're moving 
wow. science. <laughs> nice. So yeah, you can full on walk. Uh, yeah, between them, which is unreal. You know, I'm probably never going to do that in my life <laughs> ever again. Um, yeah, and then I got to see the aurora, which was cool. But the the film is it's super interesting because I always think of even if it wasn't you know an engineer that came here, sure, it could be a meteor with microbes. Yeah. Just send and out. that the way that mixes with microbes here begins life. You know, yep. it, it could be as simple as that. And then and then what we would call the engineer would be God, right? Like who knocked the asteroid that <laughs> created the and it would just go back like that. Um, someone in the comments just mentioned a, a encounter as well with a Riz Ahmed that just Ooh, came out today. I yes. Yeah. On I, Amazon I, Prime. Yeah, that's right. Um, I watched it earlier today, and I very much liked it. So I, I recommend. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm doing tonight. Then, although it's late, but yeah, why not? Why not? I think with Prometheus as well, you've got the whole before they, you know, when you get into like the modern day, you've got all these archaeological expeditions, and they're looking for these star maps. You know, and they tie them all up with different sites around the world, and that kind of leads them to uh, working out where we've come from, or yeah. where they think we've come from. You know, I think that was it. Kind of mixes a bit of ancient aliens, mixes a bit of chariots of the gods in there as well, and you know, then adds all the science, or doesn't add the science if um, <laughs> you know people have been really critical about it. <laughs> it's it's a movie, you know, you gotta let it go. <laughs> it is a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, you're up, Dave. Yeah, I'm going to um, be serious for a moment and drag in District 9. Ooh. Um, mainly because it uses um, kind of an extraterrestrial visitation almost as a statement about humanity and how we treat each other, basically. I think that was a really brave thing to do by Neil um, Blumkamp. That's his name, isn't it? South African guy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, um, you can just... Think, yeah, thing. just using, using like alien refugees come to our planet, parked above a city in South Africa, and then treating that as social commentary, I thought was um, totally different and really, really impactful at the time as well. Because how would we kind of react if something like that did happen would we you know would we treat them as gods would we treat them as inferior beings would we blow them out of the sky as soon as they arrived who knows i think that yeah. was the fact that you know the kind of the government of the of that time the first thing that they wanted to do was get hold of all the military hardware on that ship and try and weaponize it so they could you know, use it to their advantage. It's basically a power grab. Yeah, I agree. I think that was very clever that they had that really meaningful story and like what you just said mm. about how it's kind of a little bit borderline, like controversial, but then they had that small yeah. underlying bit of humor that kept creeping in throughout it with some of the characters. And, and I yeah. think that just really just rounded the edges off the kind of like seriousness of it it just made it work really well for me so yeah i think it helps being filmed in like a cop style documentary as well yeah definitely um, and then just yeah. with other you know with regular cinematography i think that was you know yeah, it works, there. and it was exactly how it should have been treated I think. totally yeah so that worked completely it could have been a bit like this is just really cringe like you're going for that slavery too much of a message mm. but they they just they drew it back a little bit enough to get it across but then still keep you engaged and still yeah. keep you like the characters interesting and and, and fun in a way yeah. yeah yeah it was a really good one <clears throat> they, they hadn't really been anything like it uh before um just just how like down and dirty it was it, it was very gritty filmmaking as well um and yeah I, I, it paid off like we've spoken about this before and I, i've said that i'm not fond mm. of when it shifts to kind of that traditional hollywood movie at the end but i i really love what it was trying to do um and the message that it is getting across it and you, you know how it makes you there there are people in the audience that would feel empathy towards how the yeah. to, towards the the visitors um and 
that that's kind of the point, right? Film, films and stories are empathy machines, and and I think it's it's a little bit of magic. There is, and there's also you know that side of the audience as well, which would be totally behind what was going on at the human level. Yeah. Absolutely. And and then films like that serve as a mirror. And, you know, I, I hope people reflect. They come out going, oh, that may, film made me feel horrible about myself. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Isn't it another one of these examples of a cult classic, though, that didn't, too, didn't do too well on release, but then over the course of the years that it's been out, it's kind of made up for it in views and... Yeah, you know, it's definitely. I think, like um, you know, when, once it came on DVD, it was just, you know, sales went sky high for it. Yeah. I know it was just word of mouth and you get like, you know, it almost became a late night student film for a bit. And then yeah, people yeah. realized how impactful it actually was. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's always a good sign. I like it sometimes yeah. when it's not, not necessarily that massive instant big hit that a Hollywood, Hollywood blocks blockbuster can be. And then it just dies a death. This one has yeah. just dragged out over the course of time as just being a good baseline message, movie, all those little elements that, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Cool. So for, for my last one, I'm going to pick, I've got between two and I don't know which one to pick. There's a bit of a crossover between them. Um, oh, wow. I'll, I'll just, <laughs> they, they're above and below. So that didn't help me at all. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, so I'm, I'm going to choose, eh, I'll, I'll say them both because they both have the thing that I want to talk about. Um, arrival and Contact. And, and the reason that I bring those up, uh, because of the way they treat time, you know, with, with Arrival, it's very much about that. Um, the story revolves around one of the character's experiences with time and how it's relative to her. Um, that's a more recent one, so I don't want to spoil the twist. But suffice to say, the story really, you know, is packed with it. That That's the idea. Um, mm. then with contact, we have a bit of a little bit of the opposite where it's about time dilation, where a person goes through an experience in a craft, they experience a long stretch of time, but to people, uh, outside of the craft, only a few seconds pass. And we've seen effects like that in, mm. uh, in cases and it, it just, it implies a certain control of time and and dimensions and contact interests me as well because it was carl sagan and yeah. people always think that he he's just didn't entertain the idea of uap or ufos or visitors to earth at all and there is some really really weird ideas in this story um about just you know other dimensional beings trying to take on forms to appease us um and and if he i would say if he were here to see a switch on the james webb telescope he would be thinking of this story right now. Um, so I'm not going to ask you guys what you thought of both of those films. Um, I will just say that. Can I just say, yeah. I'd go con- contact, time, arrival, language. Oh, yes. Because that essentially, yeah. yeah. So so I'll just elaborate just for people listening. Um, <laughs> the language of the visitors um, coffee stains. Based, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, the these coffee stains can be read forwards and backwards. Um, a better way to say it would be that their language could be experienced. I think, um, mm. as opposed to read, um, they're not linear beings like us. Um, and basically, the scientists studying them by thinking about uh, how they experience time. They, th- the way they think starts to change and become very similar and very loose with its sense of time as well. Um, so yeah, good shout actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's language versus, uh, <laughs> versus time. Good shout. No worries. <laughs> so you, you can go first this time though. Cause, cause you did that. <laughs> what for the next movie? Yeah. I think we actually only have one time for one more. So, okay. uh, yeah. I chose this movie cause I just didn't want to keep with this, like the UFO concept. I wanted to talk about something that can relate to the subject. So I'm cool. going with a more recent movie, which is annihilation. Ooh. So we have the concept of yes, a meteor crashes, but it, it creates this bubble, uh, shimmer that expands and within it, you have things that break the laws of physics, 
biology, chemistry, and things like that. So it's 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 kind of a different concept, but it makes you think, and it's still a possibility. So that's kind of why I chose that one. Nice shout. Nice. Yeah. No, that was definitely um, one of the more surprising things that came out. Um, when was it? 2018, 2017, I think. Probably a bit later than that, wasn't it? I'll have a look. I'll have a look. It's, uh, uh, when it came out, it was oh, one of Netflix's first ones, wasn't it? And it was just, wow. I mean, the, the way they handled like the, the effect on nature within that bubble. On the shimmer. 2018. Yeah. 2018, yeah. 2018, right. okay. And it is basically the colour out of space by H.P. Lovecraft, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is also a great film. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, are, are you about to tell me you don't like the Nick Cage one? It has its moments. Oh, I, I loved it. I, I like my crappy horrors and creature features. So it was yeah, right. Nick stuff. Cage didn't do Nick Cage enough. He dialed it down. If he'd done it properly, done himself properly, it would have been all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're not going to have time to talk about it now, Dave. But what was your what was your other choice? Mars Attacks. Oh, good shout. Just for the pure. For Tom Jones, right? movie kind of feel. Can I just give one shout out quickly when we're talking about movies? Yeah, and I'm going to give a shout out to our colleague Adam Goldsack, who who felt a bit ill this week and sat down and watched a film called Dark Encounter. <laughs> now, I hadn't heard of that, so I actually sat down and watched it last night. So shout out to Adam. That was something that I found mm -hmm. interesting. It wasn't amazing, but for everyone watching this or listening and you haven't seen it, go check out Dark Encounter, orbs and stuff. <laughs> Ooh. I might pop that on after uh, after this, actually. It's worth a watch, Lying you know. Down. It's worth a watch. Yeah, for sure. Shout out, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of brings us to the end of the show. It always goes way too fast, and I always have way too yeah. much stuff written down. Uh, I wonder if Andy has this experience when he's uh, playing uh, host. <laughs> um, so as we start to wrap up, I just want to tell you guys about the raffle. Um, Dave here added an awesome prize. I'm, I'm just going to share my screen and I'm not going to click the Leaf Studio button. This week. <laughs> Watch me go. <laughs> okay, so you guys should be able to see that now. Okay, yeah. So we're, we're running a raffle. Um, you can get here through uh, the URL go.rallyup.com forward slash truth. Um, when Lou is over in London, uh, we asked him to sign a, a poster that we could raffle off, and he humbly obliged. Uh, we're, we're raising money for the Humane Society International and St. Jude's uh, Children's Research Hospital. Both do absolutely vital work. We have already hit, uh, you can see there, uh, 2,255 pounds, which is insane. And thank you, everyone Amazing. who's donated. Um, so yeah, the you, you buy a ticket, you get entered into a raffle, Every ticket applies to every prize. So each prize is kind of like a new draw. But if you've bought tickets already, they apply to the new prizes. Um, so we we have this truth poster here. And then the wonderful donation that Dave made is a copy of Flying Sources from Outer Space by Major Donald Keyhole from 1953. And it's a first edition. So this is a, a copy with a lot of history. Um, Dave, are you sure you want to give this to us? Yeah, I've got the mass market paperback. It's fine. <laughs> Bless you, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and yeah, and enter the raffle. We'll, we'll be adding more prizes. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of on a, a 13 or 14 day countdown now. So it won't be too long. Um, and we'll, we'll, yeah, hopefully go out with a bang with that. Um, I just wanted to touch on my Red Bubble store. If you're stuck for Christmas gifts, feel free, have a look. Um, Olaf Rockner and I this week. Uh, popped up a holiday Christmas card, um, which you can see here. Actually, I'll show you this one. Oh, we we popped up a digital version um, on Etsy that you can send to annoy family and friends at Christmas and just use it to bring up UFOs where there was no conversation about UFOs. Why not? Um, you can find that at tinyurl.com forward slash UAP Santa 2021. Um, Hold on, I'm just going to click stop screen share and I'm not going to leave. There you go. Perfect. Yay. I'm back. Look at that. I've improved. Um, so, Vinny, what's coming up for you? Where, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, as you see in my name just here, uh, Disclosure underscore team. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Disclosure team with an underscore at the end. 
or on YouTube Disclosure Team. And I've got lots coming up. I'm, I'm live tomorrow night. I've got, got so much happening. Amazing. How about you, Dave? When, when's the new issue out? Um, new issue out would be either tomorrow or Sunday. Obviously, the Power Cup put Kai Bosch on things tonight. Um, but yeah, it's a biggie. It's a bumper Christmas and New Year special. Um, you can download it free at shadowsmagazine.co.uk over the weekend. Keep an eye on Twitter at Shadows Magazine, um, where I'll announce when it's up. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, so this week on That UFO Podcast coming up, we will have a conversation with determined and curious Ross Coltart returning to answer listener questions. Uh, we also soon welcome the brilliant Diana Pasolka, who will be joining us to discuss the phenomena. Um, the next big event we have is a roundtable with Sean Cahill and Jake Mann of Skyfall. So don't miss that. Keep an eye out for when that's going to be. Uh, feel free to send us questions to UFO uapam at gmail.com with the name of who the questions for in the subject so with all that we're out of time for the week thank you to dave thank you for Vinny for joining, joining the show you guys Thanks are awesome well. i love you. you both muchly um you too and he should be back with us next week uh fully energized you'll hear him talking to ross either way um but yeah that's all for this week keep looking up you never know what you might see that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAPAM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see.